right, that's not what I'm here to talk about. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 through 14. I apologize, I didn't give you guys the, the scriptures up there, but in the message translation, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 through 14. I have a lot more to say about this, but it is hard to get it across to you since you've picked up this bad habit of not listening. All right, we'll stop there. Not listening. By this time, you ought to be teachers yourselves. He's talking to the church. Yet here I find you needing someone to sit down with you and go over the basics on God again. Starting from square one. <laughs> Baby's milk. When you should have been on solid food long ago. Milk is for beginners and experience in God's ways. Solid food is for the mature who have some practice in telling right from wrong. This is to the church who should know between right and wrong. We went to a restaurant. We went to a nice seafood restaurant where they serve seafood at higher prices than normal Long John Silver's. And I decided as I looked over the menu, I want chicken nuggets. <laughs> Do you guys have pizza rolls by any chance? I have a preference of something that I can get at Walmart for $1.99 that I was raised on, but I have an appetite for something basic. Do you guys have peanut butter and jelly without the crust cut in half? But instead, they said, no, we have hogfish from Anguilla. Anguilla. You call it whatever you want to when you're up here. Anguilla. <laughs> I had an appetite for something else, but I was at the different place where mature people sit, cross their legs, don't use sporks. <laughs> These people that were all around me knew what they were doing because they weren't six. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, it says, When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. I added my own version in here. I prayed as a child. I studied God's word as a child. I was a picky eater when it came to reading and eating his word as a child. I didn't teach those around me Bible studies as a child. I tolerated my brothers and sisters in Christ as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. I'm here to tell you that there's hope. There is hope found in him, in a group of unperfect people who are striving for perfections. The Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord, he is good. But you've got to make up in your mind. I don't care if they're doing it around me differently. I have got to please him. So I'm going to do my best. Amen. 30 seconds. Hebrews 12 and 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, let us start here. Lay aside every weight and sin that doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience. This is to you. Run with patience the race that is set before us. Why? Why do we do it? That's for you to decide. God said, I've called you out of darkness into his marvelous life. I've called you out of the place of the, the demise and the destruction that you are heading towards. I've given you a chance at life. It is your choice. God bless you. God, everybody, everybody happy today? Amen. Amen. It's sunny. It's getting warm. I commend you, first of all, for yes. Man, you sounded different than you did last time. I'm just nervous. If he, what, what if he would have gone on like a two-week vacation? We'd have been in trouble. We'd have been in a lot of trouble. Slimmer down to about four or five days, huh? He's a, that was excellent, excellent. But thank you all for coming yesterday. 
uh, to prayer. It was a great time. The power of God was here. And I believe it is preparing the way for the future. Uh, it's amazing. Amazing what God can do. We've got a couple of new, uh, a couple of new members of the church. First of all, uh, I don't know if you've seen him yet, but Owen is back there. What a, what a darling little guy. I think we ought to... You ought to commend <clears throat> anybody that has children like that ought to have about six or seven of them, right? So praise God. So glad you guys are back. And, and uh, we've also got another new one, Isaiah. Get Come up and meet Isaiah, like not now, but like at the end of service, meet Isaiah. We're so happy. Mariana, welcome back. Good to see you. What a little doll. Thank you again for uh, your comments, et cetera, on Wednesday night. Uh, I just, I, I don't feel, I really don't feel worthy, and I know it's not, uh, it's really not false humility. I just, I'm trying to do, what it's, I heard someone say it recently, um, just a slob doing my job. Uh, oh, that was Jeff Arnold. <laughs> but, but he was quoting Jeff Arnold, and really, that's what, you know, all I'm trying to do is, Please, God, and do what he's asking me to do, and yet you guys are so kind to make me feel special, even though I'm just trying, like you, do what he asks me to do. So we're all trying to do that, and so I should make you feel special for doing what he's asked you to do as well. But thank you from the bottom of my heart for all your kind words, and, and the cookies were even good. I mean, those were good cookies. Amen. Would you mind standing with me for just a moment? <clears throat> <clears throat> kind of a welcome to all the guests that are here. I believe God has something really special for all of you today. John chapter 3, verse 3, a very, a very common verse of Scripture, but I want to approach it from a very different aspect today. John chapter 3 and verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Verse 7, Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. You must. You must. You must. It's amazing how God gave us some absolutes in the word. He said, you must be born again. I look at birth as a change. And I want to preach this morning on the subject, let's get changed. Let's get changed. Would you mind praying with me just for a moment? <clears throat> Lord. We love your word. In worship, we could feel your incredible spirit filling the sanctuary, God, and even better yet, filling us. As we worshiped you, we could sense your presence getting closer and closer, filling us with your glory, your wonder, your power as we prayed, oh God. But now we ask that you would let us hear that precious word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. God, we pray that you would use it today, and we pray that you would let it bless us, give us understanding, and lead us closer to you. We want to be more like you today, we pray in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Look at your neighbor and say, let's get changed. And God bless you. You may be seated. <clears throat> I, uh, I thought about, you, you, he says, you, you got to be born again. And I was thinking about the, 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 the brand new children we have in the place. And, and it's not, uh, it's a, it is a, an event, but it's a very dramatic event. And so it drew, me, drew my attention to this. And, and I think birth is quite a, quite a dramatic situation. I mean, there's a lot going on. I mean, it's not just, a, well, let's have this baby and okay, now, you know, what are we going to name it? And now let's uh, put some clothes on it, take it home and... I mean, it's, it's a major event to, to have a child. And I, and I thought of the various aspects of, of, of birth. And, and, and 
when, when the baby is in the womb, it eats through the umbilical cord. And when the baby comes out, it now eats through its mouth. Dramatic change. When Now remember, Jesus said you have to be born again of water and spirit. So there needs to be a change that happens. But when they ate, they ate through the cord and now they eat through the mouth. So how we eat changes. When we are born again, it's amazing the difference in how we eat changes. He said you're going to... And I did not talk to Pastor Swan about this, and he's talking about he's talking about the milk of the word, and I have it written down right there, the milk of the word, and talking about what we eat, the bread of life. I got such a hunger for the bread of life when I came into the kingdom of God, and I was born again. I no longer had a hunger for those things out there. My desire changed. My hunger changed. Not only how we eat changes. But what we eat changes. Notice when the baby is in the womb, it's, it's getting its nourishment through the umbilical cord. And when it, when it, after it is born, it now gets its nourishment from mother's milk. It's, it, what they eat changes. So when we come into the church, what we eat is supposed to change. We're not supposed to eat the same things that we ate out there. We're not supposed to have a desire and, and, and a palate for the things that the world has for us. We want to eat the new things. And how we drink changes. When they're in the womb, it's amazing. They, sometimes they, they, the ambiotic fluid, you know, in and out of the mouth and and, and they, they get their moisture through the umbilical cord. And when they come out, now they get their moisture. How we drink changes. We, it goes from, you know, the milk of the word to a river of living water. And that happens after we are born again of water and spirit. So something happens afterwards. We now drink from the milk of the word and then graduating to the river of living water. We are now drinking of the nectar of his precious word. We think of, of, of a baby, uh, the environment that they're in absolutely changes from the day before they're born to the day after they're born. The environment changes. They're susceptible to hot and cold. They're susceptible to the dry air. They're susceptible to viruses and bacteria and things that they're not, they're not susceptible in there. So our whole environment changes. So when we are born again of water and spirit, our whole environment changes. There are things that we are susceptible to that we were not susceptible to before. Our sight changes when we're born. They always look at the baby and what color are the eyes and the eyes change and can they see? No, they're blind. I don't remember. I don't remember if I could see or not when I was born. <laughs> but they say that they're blind up front and then you can see, but you definitely can't see a whole lot. I know you can see light when you're, when you're inside the womb, I, only because we would put the flashlight on the belly and the baby would turn and move and, you know, be like, you know what, I'm trying to sleep. Could you give me a another few minutes, but the sight changes. It's amazing. The temperature changes. Our temperature changes when we are born. What do I mean? When we are, before we are born, somebody else controls the temperature for us. But after we're born, our own body controls the temperature. Before we're born, when people come as visitors into the, into the atmosphere, into this place, into, the, into this environment. The mother, ooh, should I say, I'm feeling the Holy Ghost. The mother is controlling the, ap, the, the temperature that is here. People come in as babies and they are, they are okay. But the mother is controlling the atmosphere. But after you're born, you need to control your own temperature. Didn't you just say that when we mature, something happens? See, we are responsible for our own temperature. Our body produces. We have our own furnace, and it, and it produces heat. So someone else controlled before, and now we control after. How we breathe absolutely changes. How we breathe. Beforehand, a child is getting all of its oxygen through the blood system as it comes in and out of the umbilical cord and afterwards we breathe with our lungs it's 
kind of amazing. Our lungs existed beforehand. They existed long before we actually used them, but weren't in use until birth. And we come in and we need to be born again. So we come in and the Bible says, you that were dead in trespasses and sins, you know, in the garden of Eden, God made Adam of the dust of the ground and he formed him with his own hands. And the Bible says he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Adam had lungs. But God breathed in him and he became a living soul. And on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind or breath. God breathed into that room and his breath went into them that were dead in trespasses and sins. And they became alive and became a living soul. The lungs, the spiritual lungs that they had before the day of Pentecost were already there, but they were not functioning. Just like a baby that is in the womb, it has lungs, but they're not functioning yet. But after they're born, now the lungs are functioning. Lots of incredible things happen just in this simple act of being born. May I very quickly address the fact that how we dress changes. <laughs> Brother Manley got that quickly. When they're born, they're wearing something different than they wear shortly after. It's amazing how they get a bit more modest afterwards. I didn't dress modestly in, this, in the world before I met Jesus. But afterwards, I dress differently. After I'm born, I dress differently differently. Hmm. How we dress until we are born, we are clothed in the mother. The mother covers. Well, what if somebody comes in not modest? The mother is covering them for now until they're born. Don't try to put clothes on a baby that's in the womb. Come on, say that again. Good preaching, pastor. Say it. <laughs> Pastor Jans always said, don't try to fillet him before you get him in the boat. You know what I'm saying? Don't, don't fillet the fish while it's in the water. Get him in the boat. The point I'm making is people are being born into the kingdom. The mother covers them while they're being born. Our effect on others changes. Before they're born, they kind of affect only the mother. The kick Boom, boom. They, they're sitting on their heart. They're pushing on their lungs. They're messing up their digestion. I mean, they're, they're affecting the mother. But after they're born, they affect everybody. Then they kick everybody. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but they can communicate, you know, ahead of time. They're, they move around and, and they're, they're very active or, or they're upset. Or, they, you know, the mother's like smiling like, oh, what was that? Oh, he's just going to be a soccer player, you know, whatever. But, but afterwards, now they communicate with their mouth. They, they, they cry and they communicate. Lots of things change when we're born. And you can't stay in the womb. You have to change. You, you have to come out of the womb and you have to be born. Jesus said, don't stay in the womb. Much of the evangelical Christian world stays in the womb. They simply want to be covered by the mother. They want the mother to do everything for them. They don't want to grow up. They don't want to mature. They want to be fed from a bottle all of their life. And God is saying, it's time to come out of the womb and be born so that you can begin to breathe on your own. You can begin to eat on your own. You can, I mean, when, when the kids come to the house now, I'm like, you know where the refrigerator is? You know what I mean? I don't run and grab a bottle. I say, you know, have a seat in the rocking chair. I'll... They look at me and say, mom, Dad has lost it. There's refrigerator. Just coming in. Revelation 21 says, but the fearful, which the fearful doesn't mean, you know, just people that are afraid, but it's cowards, but it also means it isn't someone that loses a fight. It's someone who won't even fight to protect what's his. That's what it's talking about with a coward. We won't even fight to protect what is ours. And it says, and the unbelieving which are people that res refuse to believe and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers, which are sexual sin and sorcerers, which is evil magic and idolaters and all liars. 
shall have their part in the lake which burn with fire and brimstone. What am I talking about? We need to change. I'm talking about the change that has to happen in our lives. And, and, and we, we, we need to say, say to ourselves, I'm going to get changed. I'm going to get changed. When, when I get home today, I'm going, to, I'm going to go and cut the lawn before we uh, leave tomorrow, but I'm not going to cut the lawn like this. I'm going to get changed. And I, I've, you know, you walk through the house, and you're like, I got to get changed. I got to get changed. I got to get changed. When, when, when I'm going to go work on a project, I'm going to go and lay tile in the bathroom. I'm, I got to get changed. I'm not going to lay tile like this. But I'm also not going to come to church in the clothes that I did my tile and I'm going to get changed. We make that, commerce, that, 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 that com- commitment or that, 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 that comment so flippantly sometimes, I'm going to get changed. But what we really need to do is look ourselves in the mirror and say, you need to get changed. You need to get changed. Something needs to happen in us because the Bible says that these people are going to burn with fire and brimstone. And it is not my intention. I want to make sure that we do everything possible to help as many people get to heaven as we can. And Mark 7, 21 and I'm going to move through this quickly because I just, I just want to get the attention of the world today and let them know that people can't continue to live like they're living and expect God to welcome them with open arms. It says, for from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, which are married, and fornications, which are unmarried, murders, thefts, covetousness, which is greed, wickedness, Deceit, lasciviousness, which is unrestrained sexual instinct. An evil eye, blasphemy, which is hurtful speech. Come on. Hurtful speech. He's saying inside the heart comes hurtful speech, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. And the last scripture concerning this, concerning this is in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry. Witchcraft, hatred, variance, which is contentiousness. Emulations, which is jealousy and indignation. Wrath, strife, seditions, which is disunion, dissension, division. Heresies, which is making a decision involving disunion. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, which is rioting. And such like of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past. Sounds like three times he said it. That they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Everyone say, I'm getting changed. changed. Not a lot of people will tell you that. They'll simply say, oh, you're just, God just loves everybody. And just, just, you know, you don't have to change anything. Just do what you're doing. You know, everybody makes mistakes. And they say that. But this just said, if we're doing this when he comes, we're in trouble. We have to find a way to get out of this into something else. Now, the good good thing is this. God never demanded us to do something that he wasn't either, he hadn't already equipped us to do, or he wasn't going to give us the power to do. If he asks us to do something, then he knows that he's going to give us what we need. But he said this in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Know ye that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators or adulterers or um, effeminate, which is homosexual, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, which are abuse others with insults, nor extortioners. None of these will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's why Jesus said, now I'm going to give you some insight in just a moment that he gave me this early this morning in prayer. None of this will make it to heaven. Now, this is not being said to take away all of your hope to make it there. It's said to arrest your attention and say, you know what? He's really serious about this. God is really serious about this. And then in Romans 3.23, it says, for all have sinned. So now I know everybody was just focused on me and say, yeah, he was, a, he, was a, he was a real piece of work before Jesus got a hold of him. But the Bible says all have sinned. Everyone say, that's me. That was all of us. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Matthew 18, verse 3 says, And said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted. Everyone say changed. Changed. Except you be converted and become as a little child, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. We need to change. And this is what came to me early in prayer this morning. 
When we were born the first time, we were born completely in the flesh. When we are born again, we are flesh with the Spirit of God in. Okay? Watch this. Flesh. Flesh with Spirit. Where are we headed? Spirit without flesh. We have flesh completely. We have Spirit completely in heaven. In the middle is flesh with Spirit. That's what's happening. God is saying you are born in the flesh. That which is born of flesh is flesh. You are born in the flesh. We have to be born again. We have to receive the Spirit of God in our flesh so that we can learn how to use it. We can learn how to negotiate. We can learn how, how, how to operate in the Spirit. And when the rapture comes, He's going to take us, our bodies. Well, I'm not going to be like this in heaven. Okay? We're going to have glorified bodies, no flesh in heaven. Spirit hath not flesh and bone. We are transitioning into that. You can't go from flesh completely to spirit completely. We have to have the learning ground that we're on right now. He's saying you need to receive the Holy Ghost now so that you can learn how to use it. And then once you learn how to use it, and I blow that trumpet in and shout, the flesh is going to be left behind and heaven is going to be spiritual. What insight God gave me. He talks to me like that. He's, he, he uses my brain, which, you know, lesser than most. But he gives me insight into that and say, well, that's amazing. Because Jesus, born in the flesh, spirit, walked around, left. Now he's completely spirit. He comes and lives inside of us. We kind of are following that same pattern. And in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, let me begin to give some hope. And such were, everyone say were, were. say change. change. And such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified because Jesus went to the cross. No, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. Why did he say that? Because Jesus said you have to be born again of water and spirit. And he said, such were some of you. You changed. Why? You were washed, sanctified, and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's why we baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus, so we can be washed, which is scriptural, about 18 scriptures on it, that it washes away our sins. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission, the removal of your sins. But notice how he said that. This is who you were, all the list of evil. And then he goes on to say, but such were some of you, but you were washed. You were changed. You were born again. You used to be only flesh. Now you're flesh with spirit. And now that spirit is giving you the power to change and live for me. But he said this, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. Baptism in water, baptism in the spirit. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Water, spirit. You have to be born again of? Kind of simple, isn't it? It's, it's, the, the gospel is not that hard to understand. It, it comes up over and over and over again. Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It comes up over and over and over again about what is born again. It is being born of the water and of the spirit. They changed. What about Peter? Peter, before the day of Pentecost came, Peter was asked, did you, did you hang out with Jesus? Oh, no, 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 no. I, you, you kind of sound like him. You got, the same, you got the same kind of dialect as he had. Are you sure you're not one of those people that hung around with him? No, 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 I'm not. I'm, not. I'm sure you're the guy that was with you. No, I'm not. And he cursed and just days later, Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and preached. Repent. He preached the gospel message of the new covenant. Things are changing. Things were changed. Something happened inside of Peter where he went from denying Jesus to where he then was willing to die for him. What about Paul, who actually went around killing people that were being baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost? He went around killing those people. 
threw him to the lions, had him torn apart by gladiators. I mean, he was having him torn. He, he, he had him stretched on those stretchers and, and, and sawn in two. This is what Paul was doing before he became Paul. What a change. He met Jesus on the road to Damascus and, and he asked him who he was. Who are you, Jehovah? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. And he says, what would you like me to do from this point on? What I've been doing is not really acceptable since I've been killing people for believing in you. What would you like me to do now? I want you to go to, to a street called Straight in Damascus. Yes, sir. A man by the name of Ananias. Yes, sir. He baptized him. Saul got the Holy Ghost. He was born of water and he was born of spirit and he wrote half the New Testament. He changed. He knew that something had to change. Notice this. He didn't say, well, since I am completely devoted to what I am, then would you please use who I am and do everything the way I am? And God said, no, you're going to change. You're going to start preaching something different. You're going st- to you, you, die for my sake. You're going to be, you're going to be whipped and beaten for, for what you persecuted in the past. You're going to change. But then Matthew 7, 21 says this. Saw this for the first time in 34 years. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. So it's not just what you say that makes a difference. It said, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done Many wonderful works. You notice what they said? They said, not everyone that saith, but he that doeth the will of my Father. And then they said, look at all the things that we did. So not only is it what you say that really doesn't matter, or what you do that matters. They said, we did all of these things in your name. And he said, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me that ye that work iniquity. So it's not just what we say that matters. And it's not just what we do that matters. Because there were people that said, Lord, he said, you're saying it, but I'm not your Lord. And he said, there are people that are doing things in the name of Jesus. And he said, it's not just what you're doing. It's doing the will of the Father. That's what he said. Not what you say or what you do, but do the will of the Father. So it's not just being busy for Jesus. It's are you doing the will of the Father? We need to change. Let's get changed today. Let's get changed in how we think. Let's get changed in how we act. Let's get changed in how we speak. Let's get changed in the priorities of our life. Let's change how we look, where we go, what we do, what our, what our hunger is for, what, what we drink, how we drink. Let, let's change all of it for his sake. Matthew, how do, we need, how do we get help? Matthew 7, 8, for everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. If you're sitting here today wondering, you know, I didn't do all those things that he read on that list. There's there's some of them that are active right now. What, 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 what? How do I get changed? Man, if he comes today, what what am I? I don't want to miss it. I'm not perfect, God. Can't you just accept that? Yeah, but I'm, I've got to, you've got to be born again of water and spirit. Okay. Everyone that asketh, receiveth. Lord, please forgive me. If I ask, I will receive. Lord, will you please wash my sins away? so that all my record in heaven is clean. If we ask, it can happen. And Lord, would you please fill me with your spirit? Would you do that, Lord, today? If we ask, we shall receive. If we seek, we will find. This Bible says, feel after him, if haply 
we might find him, for he is not far from every one of us. 1 John 3.22, and whatsoever, everyone say whatsoever. whatsoever. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Most people just like the first part of that. Whatever we ask, we receive. And he said, because we keep his commandments. So when we ask him, we say, Lord, is there something that you want me to do? Yes. I want you to take my sins away. Then get in the baptistry. That he commanded, we have to be born of water. Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. I dodged that one. <laughs> and then Cornelius wasn't baptized, but he went and got the Holy Ghost. Aha! He got the Holy Ghost without getting baptized. Yeah, then Peter said, I command you to get baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Peter said, you jumped right over the labor of water. You jumped, I mean, you, you went to the altar of sacrifice. You repented and you jumped right over or ran around it or scooted past the priest or whatever and went, ran right into the Holy of Holies. Peter grabs him and says, come here, get in that tank. You got to fulfill the whole plan. Somebody said to me in Bible study one time, it was uh, when I was teaching Beth over at uh, Judson, and this young lady, uh, Brittany, she, she challenged me. She said, she, she, was, she was saying, Jesus came to fill with the Holy Ghost. And, and, and it wasn't baptism, wasn't important. And, and, and Cornelius, or, or she said that, and I said, okay. I said, then if baptism wasn't important, why, after Cornelius got the Holy Ghost, was he commanded to get in the tank? Why did they command him to get, to get baptized afterwards if it's not necessary? I'm done. She got up and left. Didn't, didn't like the word. The word is very self-explaining. But what if I can't? What if I'm having a hard time walking away from sin in my life? What, what if I'm having a hard time with it? Philippians 4.13. I can do all things. Through Christ, through Christ, not because of Christ, through Christ, through his spirit. He said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You receive the Holy Ghost, now you have power. Baptism doesn't give you power. Baptism takes away all the sins on the record in heaven. But it's the power of the Holy Ghost that gives you the ability to say no. It gives you the ability to make a decision for Jesus. When you look at a fork in the road and you say sin or righteousness, you say, no, I'm going to do righteousness. It gives you the power to do what's right. You see, that's why people, they, they repent and, and it's a wonderful experience, but they don't have the power to stop. Well, do I have to have the Holy Ghost? If you want to go to heaven, because you can't stop sinning without it. You can't stop. Well, are you, you saying you're perfect? No. But 99.9% .9 of the time, before, it was 1% of the time I was living right. You see what I'm saying? There are times, attitudes, words, you're like, oh, uh, didn't mean to say that. I don't want to talk about anybody. I don't want to say any bad words. I don't want, I, I'm not swearing, by the way, just in case you're wondering. I haven't sworn for 35 years. God can, God can deliver us of anything. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, I'm giving you the answers. Therefore, if any man be in Christ. Everyone say, in Christ. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Changed. We can be changed if we are in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are made new. If you are in Christ, flesh, flesh with Holy Ghost, and just our spiritual walk with God. We're, we're moving towards that, folks. When that trumpet sounds, we're gone. It says, we will, we will leave our corruptible and put on incorruptible. Our mortality will put on immortality. We're not going to be the same person we are before and after the trumpet sounds. John 5, 7, this is the story of Bethesda and the lame man that was at the, at the pool. And he said, I want to be healed, but when the water is, is troubled, I need to get in there, but I don't have someone to help me. Now notice, we have someone who desired to change, but he just didn't know how to do it. He just couldn't get to the water in time to be healed. There are people under the sound of my voice that desire to be changed, whether it's here or 
online. I have a desire. I just don't know what to do. I, I, I have no person to help me. Jesus walked up to that person and he said, you want to be whole? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I just, I just need to get to the water. He said, just take up your bed and walk. He said, let's just take up your bed and take it home. You're, you're healed. You see, Jesus looks at people's desire and their intentions and they want to do right and they want to be right with God and they want to live right. And we look at it and we say, I could never live like that. I'm telling you, the first time I looked at the Bible, I, right, I mean, I walked into church and I'm like, there's a lot of commandments in there. I, I mean, you, and this is really small writing, so that's a lot of commandments. You get one of those big letter editions and they're like this thick. I, I looked at that and I was so intimidated. I'm like, you guys are so perfect and there's no way I could live like that. And then he gave me the Holy Ghost. He gave me his spirit and things began to become easy for me to walk away from sin. I look at these people, and I'm struggling with this and I'm struggling. I'm like, I'm not. I got the power of the Holy Ghost. I have his word. I have the church. I have the mother who's covering me right now, helping me, <laughs> bringing me, bringing me to birth, bringing me to maturity. We didn't have a child and say, now get out of the house and go make your living. Six weeks old, you know, come on, help pay the bills around here. They come into the church. They're covered by the mother. They're born. They're learning how to eat differently. They're learning how to walk differently. They're learning how to talk differently. They're learning how to breathe differently. They're learning how to function, what's important to our lives. And they're covered by the mother. And they're taught how to mature in the house of God. All this growth is going on. And, and, and they're growing. And pretty soon they'll produce on their own. Praise God. Would you stand with me? When Jesus had lifted himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No, no man, Lord. And she said, And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Notice, they caught her in adultery. They brought her to Jesus. And they said, The law says stone her. What do you say? Trying to catch him, trying to trip him up. He began to write some things. He stooped down and he wrote down and all the accusers left one by one, the eldest from the younger, the eldest to the younger. He looks at her and he said, anybody here to accuse you? Because I'm not going to judge you without any evidence, without any witnesses. She said no. And he didn't just let her go. He said something to her. He said, now stop it. There's kind of a problem in this generation. We come to the house of God or we read the Bible ourselves and we stumble across a scripture and it, it pricks our heart. And we look and we say, well, I'm not perfect. And, you know, I would just, you know, God will just accept me how I am. He looked at her and said, no, stop it. Now go and sin. I just saved your life. Now stop it. We need to respond to the same thing and say, God, there's some things on that list. You know, I'm trying to tell the truth. I don't want to gossip anymore, God. I don't want to be addicted to anything anymore, God. I, I just, this is not about religion, people. This is about relationship with him. And when, when you begin, I don't know about you, but, but it happened to me. I walked into a church like this and it was like there was a force field or something. It's like, I'm like, whoa, man, what? Is, I could feel the power, the glory of God. And I'm like, man, I don't even know what to do with that. And then I just, I kind of, I kind of just stepped in. I started crying. And I'm like, what is the deal? That didn't happen in that other church I was in. But I kind of want some more. <laughs> it happened to me. It happened to Cameron just a couple weeks ago. 
all of a sudden you're just like, oh, this is powerful. I feel this like liquid love pouring out of heaven. It's like touching me and tingles and I'm crying and my heart is beating fast. And I thought this was like a Pentecostal religion or something, but there's, there's something going on here. It's like, it's like he's here. He goes, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Why do he say that? Because they're already walking in a yoke of sin. He's like, you want to get rid of that? No, I'm fine. I'll carry this. And just step in once in a while. You know what happens when we do that? Guilt. Shame. We feel his glory and we're carrying this yoke of sin. We feel it. We want it. But then it's, it's this burden on us. And we, we live in and out of the church. And it's shame and guilt that we carry. And we don't know what to do. And he says, take my yoke upon you. For I am meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy in my burden is light. Hmm. Acts 3. Acts chapter 3. I asked them to start playing so that I'll give you hope. I'm almost done. Acts chapter 3. I pray that you hear this today. You came with somewhat of an expectation. Some of you mature folk, we're going to come, we'll probably sing three songs. Derek will get up and make us laugh. And then he'll preach. He'll get us all serious. And then we'll have an altar call and I'll do my best to stay in the pew. Hang on for dear life. Peter and John walked up to the gate beautiful in Acts chapter 3 and they saw that lame man there again. He held out his cup. Alms. I can't walk. Alms. There was an expectation when he went to temple that day. I believe that I'll go to the temple where people have a softened heart and I'll walk away with enough money to make it till tomorrow so I can get a cup of coffee and a loaf of bread. It'll get me through till tomorrow. We have an expectation when we come. And Peter looks at him. He looks at him and he said, I know that you want to change for today. For today. But Peter looks at him and he said, I ain't got no money, buddy. But such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. Rise up and walk. You came today with your preconceived ideas of what God wanted to give you. But as you hold up your cup and you say, help me. I want to walk. But I, I really, I'm just looking to eat today. I don't really want to change. He didn't ask to be healed. He asked for alms. Give me enough to make it through the day. It is not God's intention to help you through today. It's his intention to help you walk. You're struggling walking through life. The burdens, the, the, the anguish, the pain, the rejection, the betrayal, the offenses, your desires. God, I want this to happen in my life and it just doesn't happen. You're you're, you're, you're de disappointed in life. And we're holding out a cup saying, Lord, would you please just help me make it through another day? And Jesus is looking at you saying, no, I want to help you make it through your life. I am interested in changing your life because if you, if you just get 35 cents in a cup, you may be able to get a cup of coffee, but it's not going to help you tomorrow. But what he wants to give you is enough to change who you are and what you are because he's got the power of change. Oh, yes. 
I would ask you, as you close your eyes, would, would you just cup your hands? Oh, I feel His presence just moved into this house. There's some desperation. I'm not sure what it is yet. Maybe God will lead me to it right now. But if you could just cup your hands and say, Lord, He's all over my case today because my expectations were really low. It was, I'll get through another service and we'll go out and goof around this afternoon and, and then I'll you know, try, to, try, try to be there on Wednesday. And I'm asking you a question. What does Jesus want to put in your cup today? What does he have for you? Jesus didn't say, I came that you might eat. He said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. There's some people that came desperate today. And if you're feeling that presence that I felt when I first walked in, he is absolutely speaking to you. He's saying, I'm not here to give you silver and gold. I'm here to fill your cup. I'm here to give you a well of living water. Do you hear what I'm saying? What he wants to put in your cup will overflow. He said it will be in you, a well springing up unto everlasting life. He doesn't want to fix your little boo-boo from yesterday. He wants to fix your life. He wants to give you life more abundantly. If you will throw away all religion today, just throw it away for a moment. Don't debate with the word today. Don't debate with what he's trying to do in your spirit and just say, my God, I feel his presence. I feel him reaching for me. I would ask you, if you come up to this altar with your cup and just hold it out and let it begin to pour tears will begin to flow. Your hands may begin to tremble. Your lips begin, may begin to tremble. I'm feeling the Holy Ghost in this place right now. I can hardly stop from speaking in tongues right now. But I want to give you instruction. If you'll come up and let him do it his way and say, Lord, I came for something specific. But Lord, do you know how many people came? Go ahead and start coming. I had a woman walk up that aisle back there. I said, if you have a need, she was carrying a picture of her husband who was a heroin addict and first time in church. And she's walking up, tears coming down. And she goes, my husband is on heroin. I said, lift your hands. She lifted her hands and started speaking in other tongues as the Holy Ghost filled her that moment. Didn't even pray for the Holy Ghost. See, she came to deliver her husband, but God said, I've got something greater than that. I've got something greater than just a deliverance. I've got new life for you. Oh, come on, who else? <laughs> Somebody else needs something. Would you come and just, oh, that's it. That's it, Chai, that's it. Hallelujah. I want you, Lord. I want more of you right now. I'm opening my heart to you. I have no idea what God is going to give you. But if you'll come to this altar and just open, just cup your hands and say, Lord, fill my cup with more of you. I can feel your presence right now. Let's begin to worship and let him do what he does.